intermediate value theorem. Oh boy. This one makes so much sense, somebody had to write it down. Here we go. The intermediate value theorem for a polynomial function p of x with real coefficients. Suppose that a and b are not the same and the signs of p of a and p of b are opposite. Then the function has at least one real zero between a and b. Whoa, wait a minute. This is a version of the intermediate value theorem. What does the intermediate value theorem say? The traditional one says, if you have this point and that point, and that's somewhere here where that is A and this is B, and over here this is P of A, right there, and then this one here is P of B, right there. What it says is that if P of C is in between A and B, then there exists a value A in your domain, C in your domain, that takes on a value in between those two. Why? Because this is a polynomial, if I'm connecting the dots, I can't pick up the pen. Why? Because it's continuous. So if you go here, bam, that value C, boom, corresponds to that guy there. And that's the same idea that we're using over here. Where? Down here. Oh boy. Can I get from this point to that point without crossing that line? If I cross that line, then a zero exists. Can I get from here to there without crossing that line? Some of you guys are like, well, can't you just go around the outside? That line goes forever. And never could I do that because this is a polynomial function, AKA passing the vertical line test. And if I did something like that, it wouldn't be a function. So now I'm just out here trying to function. It says that you can't go from this point to that point without crossing the line. And that's what gives you the existence of a zero in between A and B. Okay, so back up here, see? This polynomial means it's continuous. You can't pick up your pencil. The function means that it's gonna pass the vertical line test. Well, it's a little bit more specific than that. Let's see an example. So here it is. We have this polynomial f of x. I thought the polynomial needed to be named p. It's just its name. It's a polynomial. These are all um, whole numbers, and those are all real coefficients. We want to see whether or not there's a 0 in between minus 3 and minus 2 on your x-axis. So what do you do? You plug them in and you evaluate, and you try to see their sign. And here we go. I'm over here and I'm taking a look at minus 3 first. So we're looking at f of minus 3. Oh, boy. That says if I put in the polynomial I see in x, I put a minus 3. And here we go. This is 3 times minus 3 squared minus 2 times a minus 3 minus 11. Oh, boy. So this is 3 times 9. Fine. Minus and minus make mass. Six minus 11. Finish him. Yeah. So that's 27 on a good day. Minus that five, putting those guys together, and I get 22. Ooh. Now let's see what happens when we go and we evaluate that polynomial with minus two. Ooh. So we're going to change all of our x values. Here we go. We're looking at f of minus 2. All right. That says everywhere I see a minus 2, or everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put a minus 2. And here we go. This is 3 times minus 2 squared, minus 2 times a minus 2, minus an 11. Well, here we go. Hmm. Go. So this is 3 times 4, minus and minus make mass. 4 minus an 11, and then this is 12 Ooh, minus 7, giving me 5. Oh boy! So wait, did we get the same? Did we get opposite signs? When we evaluated the polynomial at minus 3, we got 22. When we evaluated the polynomial at minus 2, we got 5. Are they the same or opposite signs? They're not opposite signs. So does that mean there doesn't exist a zero in between there? That means it's inconclusive. 
Why? Because at those two points, bam, bam, oh, we're over here, bam, minus three, and bam, minus two, not to scale. At minus three, we're at 22, we're up here, see? Bam, that's 22. Oh, and then at minus two, we're down here at five, bam. This doesn't tell us that it crosses that line. It may, it could do something like this. And then there'd be two zeros in there, but we don't know that. So we don't know anything.